to do with the state's political persuasion, or does it more have to do with the fact that Google tends to pull data that's locally based? So if you're in a liberal area, you're going to have a lot more liberal type results because of just what is available. Does that make sense? Um, in, in my mind, those two things that you said are, are equivalent. Right? Why does why would a state have more conservative or liberal? Because typically, probably the people are, are more are more in that area. So, really, it's kind of like uh, you know. I, I think both those are the same same form of, uh, of the thing, just phrased a different way. But yeah, yeah. In a nutshell, you're right. The bottom line is is that your search results are localized, and the localization of it usually is something fairly innocent. Like, for example, if I'm looking for an Italian restaurant, I don't care if the best one in the world's in Boston, right? I'm not driving from here to Boston. But there are other, there, there's social implications of that too, you know? Whereas if I looked up a particular candidate, I'm liable to get things that are, that are related, that, that have a local bias towards that candidate as opposed to that. And that might be good, that might be bad, I don't know. It, it's just... I think an unattended, unintended consequence of this localization feature. Well, here's intended, though. I mean, they're watching you so closely when you go to shop. You know, if you don't have your privacy set, right, you know, they know exactly what you're looking it, for. It is amazing to me that I, two, two things, uh, two things that are amazing to me. Um, one is, uh, there, there's two things that I searched for uh, over the summer. One is I was discussing, and I won't embarrass my daughter by going into the full details of this, but we were, we were discussing the, the painting Washington Crossing the Delaware, all right? Um, and so I searched for it, I Googled for that, and I found a, uh, the, the famous painting of Washington Crossing the Delaware, you know, and I showed it to her. The other thing is when I was a little kid, I played a flute. So I was looking for flutes online, you know, I, I did some searching. It's amazing now that I will see ads on Facebook, for example, for prints of Washington crossing the Delaware, <laughs> or ads for there is a flute available, or whatever. It's just like, wow, you know? I mean, I even get this stuff, and, and sometimes it still amazes me. You, you know what I mean? It, it's like just something small like that, and it's like, wow, you know? Us, at least it helps us know what our kids are up to. <laughs> yeah, well, well this, is, this is actually, fair enough, this was actually me Googling something to show her. So in this case, it was, it was what I was up to. But yeah, I, I definitely see your point. All right. So how does, now, now we're going to focus specifically on ASP.NET, on the ASP.NET platform. All right, we, we've covered some conceptual things, but... Let's get into the, the nuts and bolts of it. How does ASP.NET do this magic? All right. It does it a couple different ways. First of all, for every page, there's two files. At least the way we're doing this, we're using the web forms model, um, at least to start. So for every page, there's two files. There is the web form file, which is roughly analogous to the HTML page. And it's going to end at an ASPX extension. So if you want to verify who's using ASP.X, just look at the URL. And if you see the URL end in an ASPX, you know that it is a, a uh, ASP.NET platform. So you have the web form, which is the ASPX. You then have what's called the code behind file, which in our case could, could either be in Visual Basic or C Sharp. We're going to be using C Sharp. And as such, it's going to end in this, aspx.cs. So if I had a web page called default.aspx, 
The web form would be default.aspx. The code behind would be default.aspx.cs. <clears throat> the web form is a page that the user is going to request. The code behind simply exists to help create the page that the user gets. The ASPX page is going to be a mix of plain old garden variety HTML and ASP.NET controls. You could say controls, you could say components. Either of those are synonymous. Why is there HTML? Plain old static HTML. We learned that HTML by definition is static. Why plain old HTML? Well, because even in dynamic pages, certain portions of the page don't change. Right? If you go to Amazon, there's a list of links at the top of the page, and those links are probably identical on every single page. All right? So for the stuff that doesn't change, you don't need fancy server-side scripting stuff. You can just use plain old HTML. So really, if you look, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at just about any dynamic page, there's parts of it that are dynamic and parts of it that are static. All right, so typically not the entire web page is 100% dynamic and every aspect about it changes. And again, and if you went and looked at Amazon, you'd sort of notice a template that the logo, yeah, that's the same on every page. Some links, that's the same on every page. The middle section where the product picture is, well, that's going to be different for each product. The description is going to be different for each product and so on down the line. So the HTML... <clears throat> that's part of an ASPX page, is um, the static part. The ASP.NET controls are typically the dynamic part. All right. <clears throat> now, what do these ASP.NET controls look like? They look like HTML tags. All right. And we'll see an example in a minute here. They look like HTML tags, but they're not HTML tags. And typically, they will be preceded by an ASP and a colon. So if you're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you're looking at an ASPX page, you see something like that. That's an ASP.NET control. What, do, what, what, what is done with these ASP.NET controls? They are used to generate some combination of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. All right? Why do that? Well, because with one HTML control, oh, I'm sorry, with one ASPX control, control, we can generate a whole mess of HTML. So it makes it simpler. Where does the code behind come in? With the code behind, we can access and manipulate these controls. So for example, just to give a very simplified view that we'll expand upon later. There is a ASP.NET control called a grid view that gets bound to a data source. All right? And that data source accesses a database. We can write code that takes a value of a text box, sticks it in the SQL data source, retrieves the data, so that we can make that grid view display data that's the results of a web uh, of a search of our site. All right? So what's in the code behind file is code to manipulate this. 
Simple example would be doing calculations. Let's say we were going to do calculations of converting Fahrenheit to centigrade. And my absolute favorite first program to do in any language. All right. We have a text box on our page. We might have a button that goes ahead and does a calculation. But there needs to be something that takes the value that's in the text box, does the math on it, whatever the math is, and then outputs the answer. That's going to be in the code behind file. Another way to say this is this is the presentation this is the processing Now in the textbook they I think the very first examples they show you where they put the code behind stuff in the same file as the, the web form. We're not going to do that. From the start, we're going to put them in separate files. Why do you think it's important to have the user interface or the presentation in one file and the processing logic in another file? Reusability. Reusability, for number one. And closely associated with that is maintainability. All right. You'll see a lot of examples in programming where you separate things into like little pieces and then make the pieces talk to each other. If you've even just had CISS 216, you know that we have HTML pages and CSS files. And we don't like mash them all together. Why don't we mash them all together? Because then it's easy to change one without affecting the other. All right. To be sure, the two need to talk to each other, right? But we're then able to, with keeping HTML and CSS separate, have a page look one way on a desktop machine and have it look a completely different way on a mobile device. So by keeping things separate, that gives us so much more flexibility for what we can do. And here is no difference in that. By separating that presentation logic, it makes it easier to maintain because it's cleaner. You don't have to sift through a pile of code to find the code that you're looking for. It's very clean. And you, you run the possibility, if you do a good job at it, to making code that is easily maintained and, and in some cases reusable. All right. Let's look at a specific example. And the first example that I usually pick is, is pretty dramatic. And that is to create a little calendar. The reason I create a calendar is this is an example where one ASP.NET control generates a whole mess of HTML and JavaScript and CSS. So I open up Visual Studio. I will go to File, New, Website. I will pick an empty website, and I will put it on my desktop. Now, notice by default it wants to put it in the Documents folder, Visual Studio. So if you're not really paying attention and you click through this, that's where it's going to put it. But I'm going to put it deliberately on the desktop so I don't lose track of it. And I will call it Thursday, because today is Thursday. Thursdays, by the way, are my Fridays, so I'm always very happy on Thursdays. <laughs> Ask me if I want to create the folder. Sure, I'll go and do that. I'll click OK. It does its thing. It creates an empty web application, but not really empty, right, because it creates a web config file. 
because you absolutely have to have a web config file to run ASP.NET. The web server pulls some parameters from that to know how to treat this particular web application. Now I need to create a page. So I'll go File, New, File. And I'll pick a web form. Generally speaking, the very first one we want to be um, a, a name default.aspx. We want our language to be C sharp, so we make sure that that's selected. And we want to make sure that this is checked to place code in a separate file. Because again, regardless of what the book says for the first example, we want to right out of the right out of the starting gate always create that separate file so that we can um, get the clean separation and easily maintain. So I'll click add and away we go. Notice again. That we have three views. Design view is sort of a WYSIWYG view. Split shows you both. Source shows you the code. And notice that this is um, just plain static HTML, right? If you remember um, from what I said before, really every dynamic page, or typically dynamic pages, contain pieces of which which are just plain old HTML. So you don't really need dynamic stuff for everything. So we sort of have a shell of static stuff that we're going to add some dynamic HTML to. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put calendar as a title. Again, it's plain old HTML. Alright. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to drag over an ASP.NET calendar control. Alright, so I, I mouse on it and I drag it over here. I could do this either in um, the design view or I could do it in the source view. So I'll drag that over there and it creates for me an ASP.NET calendar control. Now just as I described, this looks like an HTML tag, right? You have the, the angle brackets. And then you have the ending tag. But this is not an HTML tag. This is a ASP.NET component, ASP.NET control. Which means that when the web server processes this, it's going to take this control based on the parameters that have been set for this control, which I haven't set any parameters for it in particular, but so it's taking a lot of defaults. It's going to go and it's going to create an HTML page that contains the HTML for a calendar. All right. So let's go and run this. All right. Here's the ASPX page. There is no code behind in this case. I mean, a code behind file got created, but we're not really doing any processing. So therefore, um, we don't really... Uh, you know, there won't be anything in the code behind file for this one. All right. Let me click Run to test this in Google Chrome. It doesn't know that I want, that I'm able to debug it because of the default web config. Uh, so just say yes. Enable debugging. The web server does its thing, it, again, it fires up the default web server, or the, the development web server, rather, pulls up this page, and creates a calendar for me. Now, let's look at the source of this HTML page that got produced. All right? We need to be clear on, because this machine is both my client and server in this example, we need to be clear on the perspective that we're having in, in whenever we look at something. 
Right now, we're going to be looking at it from the client's perspective. We're in the browser, and I'm going to right mouse on this, and I'm going to say view source. That's viewing the output of the web server. This is viewing the HTML that gets created. And if we look at the source of this, we'll see it generated a whole mess of stuff. <laughs> Here's actually the calendar proper. What is a calendar? A calendar is a table, right, with rows and columns. So that one control generated a whole bunch of HTML. And, but it also generated some CSS to, do, to format this. And it also generated some JavaScript. What kind of JavaScript? Well, as we click on this, we can go forward or backward through the calendar. Now, if you think about it, how many web applications need a calendar? A lot of them, right? Not all of them, maybe, but that's certainly not an unusual feature to have on a website. You know, every college probably has a, ca a calendar of events or, or a sporting team has an event, a, a venue for concerts or whatever has a calendar of events. All right? So a calendar is something that's pretty common in the web world. Now, what they've done, and again, this is sort of, the process you go through when you create a framework is you take something that's pretty common and you make it easy to do. All right? So to simply make a calendar, boom, it's easy to go and do that. As we review these ASP.NET controls, what we'll see is the very common things that people do on web applications or within web applications, there's typically going to be a component for that. All right? That way, you're not starting every project at ground zero. You're starting using components that have already been tested and are reasonably assured to be working properly. All right? <clears throat> Back in the old days, in pre.NET world, when they were simply plain old ASP, or sometimes I hear people say classic ASP, which galls me, because usually when you think of something as classic, you think of it as being like really good, <laughs> all right? And classic ASP really wasn't all that classic in that respect. <laughs> you essentially had to code all this kind of stuff yourself, all right? So you had to write code to do everything. If you had a form that had some validation, you had to write the code to validate it. So there were millions of web developers throughout the world, each one of them writing their own little snippet of code to validate a text box and make sure that the user entered a date into it. All right? And so on and so forth. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's nice if you have a component like that. You know? Think about if you were, you know, if you were a woodworker, if you were a carpenter. Wouldn't it be nice to go to a hardware store and get boards of approximately the size that you wanted and that way you had a starting point to build your table or cabinet or whatever as opposed to every time you wanted to build a cabinet someone just gave you an axe and pointed you at a forest all right <laughs> where you had to go chop the tree down you know saw it down in the boards and all that when you have a starting point like that that takes some of the work off you and leaves you to work on the stuff that's truly distinct about your product all right? Every carpenter in the world is going to want boards of certain standard sizes, probably. All right? Every web developer in the world is going to want to be able to validate a text box to make sure that certain values are in it. So if a component can be given, that gives us, uh, we talked about frameworks last time as a jumping off point or, or uh, something to build upon. If you give developers that component to build on, then they can busy themselves with the real important stuff, 
with the stuff that is distinct to their application. All right? So the calendar is probably the most dramatic instance, of, or one of the most dramatic instances of that, because one line of code generates not just a bunch of HTML, which it does, but it also generates JavaScript to go between uh, day and day, or, or month and month, and it even generates some style code to make it look this way. Okay? Now remember, not to belabor the point, but if I were to go out here and try to open that in a web browser, don't know anything about an ASPX page, right? You're asking the browser to eat a recipe, all right? And it doesn't know anything about this, so therefore it blows up. That server-side code has to be processed first by a web server, and that processing takes this script, which is some instructions, and goes and creates the, creates the stuff that the browsers do understand, the HTML, the CSS and the uh, JavaScript. Now, let's go into Design View for a minute. Because Design View is there. You can use it. I just don't like when people rely completely upon it. All right? Because there'll be a time where, you, where, where I won't say you can't do what you want to in Design View, but it might not be immediately apparent, whereas if you can go back and read the code, a lot of times it jumps out at you what's wrong. So let's see some of the things we can do with this. Oh, we have an auto format. So we can format this calendar a variety of different ways. Make it a schedule calendar? The calendar doesn't do that automatically, but you could simply, you certainly could take this and expand upon it to do that. Yeah. Would you write a separate CSS file if you want to do something completely different than what they have in the design view? Yep. You, you could do that? You could do that. Okay. One of your properties too? Repeat please. I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, could you change a lot of those colors and stuff in properties? Yeah, we'll, we'll look at all these. This is kind of a very simple sort of theme where you can say, oh, okay, I want this theme. And boom, you get it. Also associated with this is a whole mess of properties that you could change for this calendar. So for example, it shows a full month name for the next and previous month. So if we look here, it says July and September. We can customize that property to say, I want to see the short month. Then it will show just J-U-L and S-E-P. All right. Um, let's see. As was mentioned, yeah, we could change some colors of it if we wanted to. There, I changed the color of the date. Could change the height of it. width of it. Could you change the width to percentage? Probably. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of properties for every one of control that you can, every control that you have that you can customize it to do what you want. Now, this is important because you can set these properties two different ways. One is you can set them initially in the ASPX file through the properties, just like we're doing now. <clears throat> Again, you can do that in the design view, or you can do that in the source view. We don't like 14%, we can make 10%. We don't like the font style to be 8 point, we can make it 12 point. 
So you can change those properties that way when you're designing the page initially, either through the properties or through the source view. But here's the fun part. We could